Hey guys, Grinchers here, and welcome to my latest video series, Deck Building Fundamentals in Duelist, Volume 1. This will be a multi-part series where I go over some basic and advanced techniques often used when building decks in Duelist, and today's video will be covering some of the core concepts that Duelist revolves around, um, as far as deck building goes, from the replace mechanic, to defining archetypes insofar as Duelist is concerned, um, talking about the importance of card draw as well. Um, in no way do I aim to make the assertion that um, these will be the only archetypes you see when we cover those. Um, Duelist is a very complex game, and many archetypes exist only due to the board. However, I do aim to explain some of the more popular ones um, that exist in other card games and have transitioned into Duelist in similar manners. So, with that being said, let's just jump right in it. Alright, so first off, I want to talk about building around replace. Uh, this is something that I think a lot of people struggle with when they first come to Duelist. Um, they they don't really realize how much impact the uh, replace mechanic has on their deck building. Um, so let's just break it down. <clears throat> Do, re replacing a card takes a card from your hand and puts it back into your deck and draws a random card. Now there are certain rules around this in that you cannot replace into an identical co copy of the card, meaning... If I build my deck of 39 cards, which is a, p a potential of um, 13 unique cards at three times each, that is the that is the minimum amount, or that is the maximum amount of, uh, or I'm sorry, that's the minimum amount of unique cards you can have. So you have 13 unique cards and three of each. Um, if I were to replace a card in my hand that was a three of in my deck, and uh, just one in the hand, so two two remain in the deck and um, one is in the hand. If I replace that, I cannot get one of the copies that is still in my deck. So if I have one Primus Fist in hand and two still in my deck, I cannot replace and get one of these Primus Fist. That won't that won't happen. I will get a different card. Now, at the end of my turn, I can still draw back a Primus Fist. There's no rule against that, because that's just drawing a card. It's just like, oh, Primus Fist is, you know, it got put randomly into my deck and it got randomly drawn back out. Which is something a little different from physical card games, in that, you know, sometimes when you, um, sometimes when you you have cantrips or something like that that draws a card, it'll say put it on bottom of your library or shuffle it into your deck. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, in Duelist, we don't have a shuffle mechanic, and there's no telling if a card goes onto the top of your library or the bottom. So, um, you can get a little, a little bit of variance in ter in how you will replace a card and draw it back at the end of your turn. It's kind of just random. Um, so there's that, but the replace mechanic can be utilized to uh, great effect if you know the rules surrounding it. And one of the rules I want to talk about has a lot to do with this concept, consistency. And now I've, got, I've written in my own little explanation for this. Um, consistency is the likelihood of drawing the same card from one game to another. If a deck has less unique cards, the more consistent it will be, regardless of performance. Um, this means that if I built a deck of 39 cards and I built it at 13 unique cards, three of each, because I can have up to three of the same card in my deck, um, that would mean that I am running only 13 different cards. So I, at any stage of the game, and since they're all three of they all have the same likelihood of being drawn at the, in the opening hand, then the replace, um, it has they have like the lowest level of variance as far as uh, drawing specific cards from my deck into my hand, just because there are less variables. So, regardless of how well the deck performs, it will be more consistent because it draws the same cards from game to game, and that can vary slightly just due to luck, but it it does help um, give you solid game plans for the early game mid game and even the late game because a deck that um, <clears throat> wants to excel in the early game you will have a much greater chance of drawing those early game cards and replace it with big cards so you have them in the early game and then in the mid game you have can replace away those early game cards and look for those mid game cards etc so consistency as far as deck building goes um, and duelist can be you know utilized as far as the replace mechanic goes just by limiting the um, 
bad outcomes, I suppose, of drawing and replacing, because if you have too many one ofs in your deck, it can start to get a little complicated. And um, this will be a slightly convoluted uh, explanation, but um, basically, if I have a deck of 39 cards, and I, I, I'm not going to do any hard um, uh, explanations, I'm not going to do any hard uh, formulas here, but if I have, uh, at some stage, I have three cards in my hand and 27 cards in the deck, okay? And let's say uh, the, the 27 cards in my deck and three in hand. Uh, one, one card in my hand is a Primus Fist, and there are two other copies of Primus Fist in the deck, okay? Now, the next card in my hand is a Healing Mystic. I have one Healing Mystic in hand, and no healing mystics in the deck. Then the next card is a uh, holy immolation. I have a holy immolation in hand and two in the deck. So let's say the rest of my deck, uh, for the sake of argument, is the two holy immolations, the two primus, f or the one holy immolation, the two primus fist, and the other 24 cards are all three ofs. It's just to throw it out there. Or, and then there's like a one of or something like that, but we'll, we'll use the exact example. Basically the concept I want to go over here is um, when I'm choosing to replace one of these cards, if I'm looking for a sun bloom, okay, and there are three sun blooms in my deck, when I'm replacing that Primus Fist, that Healing Mystic, or that Holy Immolation, each of those cards has a different, um, different, uh, different chance, there, that's the word, to find the specific card in my deck. The Primus Fist, by replacing this card, actually has the highest chance to pull these one of these three Sunblooms, because not only am I looking for the Sunblooms, which is a 3 in 27, so a 1 in 9 um, chance, I'm, it also ha uh, decreases the odds of pulling another Primus Fist. So now, I've actually gone from a, one in, a 3 in 20, or a 1 in 9 which is a 3 and 27, to a 3 and 25, because there are two cards it cannot draw, if that makes sense. I replace Primus Fist, can't draw either of the other two Primus Fists, so it's a 3 and 25. That's sort of simple to understand. Um, now this Healing Mystic, however, since there are no copies of it in the deck, it is a replace the Healing Mystic, and it is purely a 1 and 9, 3 and 27. So, slight difference there. While not exactly, you know, concrete evidence of, oh, this is why replacing the best, that, that type of card in your hand is always the best option. No, that's not always the best option, but it is a decision that you can make to increase the likelihood of drawing a specific card. And the Holy Immolation, since there is one copy in the deck, there would only be a 3 and 26. So, with these, with this example, it's sort of basic and, you know, hard maybe hard to grasp right away, but it is it is a mechanic that um, high-level players utilize quite frequently in tournament settings, when they're thinking about their replaces, when they're thinking about um, what what's the likelihood I'll get this card by, by in the next couple of turns to help me out in this spot, you know? So there's, there's quite a few variables that kind of go into how to replace in this game, and deck building can be very subtle when it um, helps you do that. So basically, the more three ofs, the more consistent, even if it um, it comes at a slight disadvantage of not having tech cards available or situational cards that you may want as two ofs in your deck. So you kind of have to build around that and just know that you will be less likely to draw cards that are not three ofs. Even if it's you know completely random and you do see them every game, it is, there is the mathematical principle that you will see those cards less frequently, or you are supposed to, at any rate. And the same goes for one ofs. So, thinking about that when building your deck um, can really eliminate a lot of, uh, I want to say, dead draws, like the deck just bricking. Because if you put in a deck of like 10 one ofs, it can be very difficult to um, see those same one ofs from game to game. It can also bring them, make them impractical choices. Um, from game to game, because these cards 
could be too situational, could be too varied in, in practicality. So you, you, you kind of just got to make the decision for yourself. Are these good cards? Am I always playing these cards? And I have developed a, um, or I've, I've, I've come up with a term that applies in finances and other real world aspects and how it comes to do list is called opportunity cost. Now, Webster says the loss of potential gain from other alternatives when one alternative is chosen. Kind of a, whoa, what's that? Well, in Duelist, this refers to the wasted hand space of cards that may be too circumstantial. You can determine the value of a card by tracking how often you replace it. Use this information when you wish to add alternative cards to your deck and are considering which cards to replace. So what I mean by this is if I am putting, let's say, two Hailstone Golems in my deck, okay? And I play 20 games, and I find myself never playing Hailstone Golem for whatever reason, and I'm always replacing it. I am paying an opportunity cost of having this in my deck. I basically have a useless card in my deck, so to speak. Um, and I want a non-useless card. I want, a, I want a card in that spot that I could play quite frequently. Or I would, you know, th it's, it's basically how to track the uh, amount of wasted potential in your hand and in your deck and what you're missing out on by not having a different card in that slot. So it's a very um, next level, I think, way to think about changes you can make to your deck when thinking about your own adjustments. You gotta always be mindful that, man, I seem to really be replacing Tempest or Hailstone Golem or whatever. Well, it's not necessarily true that um, that means that you should replace that card um, as far as deck composition goes, because for example, Obliterate in Cassava is one of the most replaced cards in the deck just because it may not come out um, when, when it's time to play the card you may not have enough creep tiles, and you're like, ah, oh, man, I'm never going to have enough creep tiles, so you replace it. Or it's early game, it's eight mana, and you you, know, you, you don't want to hold on to it all game, so you replace it. But that doesn't mean I replace the card in the deck. What it can do, like I said, though, is tell you which cards are not performing um, as well as you want them to, and it's basically how you can discern which cards to replace when thinking about your deck from a compositional aspect. And uh, this has a lot to do with, uh, this can be tracked via the replace mechanic. So don't sweat it. It's not quite making sense yet. Just think about it later on after you've built your deck, you've thought about your consistency, you've thought about the replace mechanic, you've thought about all these one-ofs, and you're thinking, well, these one-ofs, some of them just would be better off as more copies of some of the cards that are in my deck. For example, for some reason you're not running three Windblade Adepts. Um, you're running one Windblade Adept. And then you have, you know, two Golem Metrologists. Well, are you running other Golems? No, you're just running Golem and Metrologists because you have it. You're thinking, wow, this is this is cool. Well, I'm not running Golems. So I don't have that. Why don't I just run Windblade Adept? That's a very basic, uh, you know, comparison. Another comparison would be... Let's say, for example, that you always like Healing Mystic instead of Azure Herald, um, which is, you know, if, if you make that argument that you always think that Healing Mystic, you think that Healing Mystic is always better than Azure Herald, it makes no sense to run two Healing Mystic and one Azure Herald, right? You, if, you, if you would rather see three Healing Mystic. So that can sort of be implemented into your deck building. Um, when you're thinking about value cards, cards that you like better, it's it doesn't make sense to car, not run cards that you think are strong for the sake of options, because those options can limit your uh, the amount of opportunity costs that you are um, av have available left to you, when considering your deck, you know, the amount of potential that you could be wasting. So there, there's quite a few variables there when thinking about uh, deck building to consider. So, uh, I know that was kind of a big what are you talking about, Grinch? And I'll get more to the, I'll get more into that in the card draw section, but it has a lot to do with um, just understanding which cards are good, which cards are bad, and 
um, understanding how to replace the cards that are bad with good cards that could see more play. And it, it, it's basically useful tactics for experimenting, even if you don't know what cards are good or bad. If, but if you know that you're always replacing this card, you know, I'm, I'm never actually playing this card. Why am I not playing it? Well, try swapping it out with a different card. Maybe you'll start playing it more. You know? Think about every time you, you're going to, like, say, oh, man, I'm going to go replace that Hailstone Golem. Um, that Think about a different card in that spot that you were thinking about putting in the deck. Think, well, I was going to put Dancing Blades instead of Hailstone Golem. Would Dancing Blades be applicable right now? You look at the board, and you say, yeah, it would. It would kill that right there. Hailstone Golem just doesn't do anything right now, so... You know? Okay, next game I'm going to swap out Hailstone Golem for Dancing Blades. So, just a small... Um, small technique for thinking about what to put in your deck and how to change your deck. Obviously, it's subjective in a lot of ways to which cards you're actually uh, replacing, but it is very useful information to have as a deck builder. Last state part I want to define real quick, and this will be something I use more on in the video, is uh, tempo. And I've pulled up a wiki from the MTG Salvation definition, so it's not my own. And uh, this is one I've, I threw at a couple other players before making the video, and they agreed this, this applies to Duelist um, very well. I find this a very good definition. Tempo is a term to describe the pace at which one plays threats. It is often used in conjunction with mana acceleration. Aggro decks, as well as mid-range decks, generally win with tempo and often trade card advantage to gain it. Now, this applies to Duelist in a few ways. Uh, for example, Tempo Lionar is a very good example. We have a few decks that are actually labeled Tempo in Duelist, and um, how this applies is that they will often play just a bunch of threats really quickly in order to secure the early game and overwhelm the opponent uh, uh, before they have a chance to play their or before they can react efficiently enough. Now, um, this is important because when you're understanding playmaking in the game, you know, a zero tempo play, an example of a zero tempo play would be playing a card like Frostiva, okay? Frostiva in um, Vanar is a 5-mana 3-3 three, three with force field, and then it has that special ability of whenever something attacks it, it summons a random 3-3 three, three in a random space. But this is a zero tempo play, because when you play the card, nothing happens immediately, regardless of how good the card is, right? So you can sort of give give all the cards that you're playing an invisible value um, as far as how much tempo I'm gaining, how much tempo I'm losing, just by you know playing the card. Something with Provoke, for example, like Silver Guard Knight or Iron Cliff, is actually higher tempo than a card without Provoke just because it forces, it changes the board state immediately. It has an impact on the game. It also has preventative measures, um, like for example, Rush Minions have a harder time bypassing Provoke. So uh, with, with this in mind, Tempo can be given a sort of, like I said, an invisible value, just based on the cards and what they do. And um, understanding this when, um, deciding what cards are good and bad in Duelist comes down to understanding which cards impact the board immediately and which cards don't. And this has a lot to do with um, the, the metagame, so to speak. Uh, sometimes in Duelist we do every now and then run into metagames where big bombs that don't do anything immediately are playable. Right now I wouldn't say that's the case, but that's a different discussion. Um, but there are times when just playing a big threat is your best course of action in Duelist. If people, you know, forego single target removal for some reason, then playing a seven mana card that does nothing can be good. But there's also the idea that um, playing two cards will be better than one in Duelist. So playing two will some will for the in the general be better than one as far as power goes, as far as tempo goes, just because the lack of AOE removal in Duelist or the inability to react efficiently because single target removal is so strong however it's costed sort of appropriately 
as far as duels it goes. Uh, in mo in most cases, for example, um, Eggmore four mana hits one target, removes the removes it. Now, that's uh, in the early game. If you Eggmore something like a three drop on four mana, that's your whole turn. Well, if they played a three drop and a two drop, it's an up. You know, it's it's a it's a positive for the player that played two threats, the three drop and the two drop, because uh, they played one card, only removed one threat, and you still have a threat on the board. So if you had just spent five mana to play one minion and they egg morphed it, it's a net zero for the person that played the um, the removal. Or it's, it's a net zero for both players, but you lost your threat, and now you're forced to play another threat and another one. Now, you can use this against your opponent in the sense that, oh, I'm just going to waste all his removal. Well, if he keeps removing, eventually he's going to be able to play cards that threaten the board and remove. So, you know, th there's different nuances to both sides of it. But for the most part, just understanding how powerful tempo can be in Duelist as far as playing multiple cards a turn can be uh, a great advantage when considering what type of deck you're playing and how you play the game. Now, in the, la in the, uh, the later uh, part of this, they go over, they often trade card advantage to gain it. Now, what that means, that has a lot to do, um, or th that's really relevant in Duelist is what I'm trying to say. Um, and we'll expound on that as we jump into card draw. The importance of card draw. Now I have here some copies of cards that are, uh, basically these are generally what's available um, to everybody. There's a few more that cost more mana. I think like the Necroseer or whatever, the five mana, five four. The uh, There's Ruby Rifter, I think there's Exune uh, Scientist. Those cards I didn't feel like including because quite frankly, they're not played and they're very slow and low impact. Even if they do have somewhat good engines on them for card draw, they're just not that strong and not played today. Um, one of the cards on here even isn't even played, but it, I felt like including it because it was um, an option out there. So you're thinking about tempo and you're thinking card advantage and you're thinking, well, if I just keep playing threats, if I play two cards turn one, two cards turn two, two cards turn three, you're gonna be out of cards before you know it because you only draw one card at the end of your turn in Duelist. We used to have two card draw over a year, or almost a year ago, actually, almost a year ago. And um, that was, a real thing. Everyone played two cards every turn. It's because you always would draw two cards. So, you know, you're always getting your hand back. You're always playing threats. Well, and do, that's not no longer the case. And we sacrifice a lot of, um, you know, card advantage for the sake of tempo, and, and really need tools to replenish your hand. And how you go about doing that varies from deck to deck. Some decks um, rely purely on um, aggressively statted minions. Um, Blazehound. Ah, there's another card I, I didn't pull up on here. Shoot. Um, I'll actually do that once at the end of this. There's another card I didn't pull up on here. Void Hunter. That was a mistake. Um, I meant to put Void Hunter on here. Uh, Blazehound, for example, he's very aggressive. 4-3. He cantrips himself. You play him, and then he draw. He has opening gambit. Both players draw a card. Now, that's pretty good, right? You draw one card for playing one card. However, your opponent draws a card. So that means you have to ha create a situation or create a, a, a mindset for your deck where it doesn't care that your opponent drew a card. It can't. It can't afford to, right? Because if you're going to draw them a card, how can you respond, you know? They're getting just as much card advantage as you are. So either you play it when their hand is full, which is a little more rare than, you know, otherwise thought. But when you're thinking about how this card impacts, you usually think about this this card being played in aggressive decks. For example, um, Aggro Abyssian or something. You play this card because it has four attack, and if your opponent uh, removes it with their general, it dealt four damage, and it replaced itself. So you basically you paid three mana for four damage, and if it hits two things, you just paid three mana for eight damage net across the board. So it can be a very good card. The problem is that in a control deck or a slower deck, this minion will not stick around on the board as long. So even though it does damage, right, you're probably not running a deck type in a control deck that uh, can capitalize on the 
uh, the low board impact, meaning uh, the lower HP the opponent has, etc. If this dies right away to a Dancing Blades, or if they just punch it and they only took four damage and then they played a threat, and now you are stuck. Oh, I gave him a card. The damage didn't matter because I'm not playing aggressive cards. I'm not playing cards that can kill him quickly. Now my opponent has card advantage and I'm just kind of stuck treading water. Or board advantage and I'm, you're stuck treading water. So you have to consider this card the upsides and the downsides, and which type of deck you put it in kind of makes an impact. Now, as a budget option for deck building, it's definitely a great card for um, newer players. It gets the card, it's strong, it trades trades fairly well. Sometimes it'll, it can trade up quite a bit, which means it'll kill something of higher value quite a bit, and it kills, you know, it also does the damage to the face. So it's, it's a great card on a budget, but it's not exactly the value engine that some of these other cards can be. Mogway, for example, um, when two card draw changed to one card draw, he went from 4 HP to 3 HP, and he was actually played in older Duelist um, a little bit. I know players like No Way It's Jay, famous tournament winner, um, he used to play it quite a bit. And I know a few others, or I remember a few others that played it. Um, I myself could never really, I never really played it a whole lot. But he does have this um, this upside, this massive upside. After this moves, draw a card. Now what that means is when he moves, he you physically take him and move him um, on his on your turn. It doesn't mean juxtaposition. It doesn't mean blink. It doesn't mean um, Mr. Egg and Seal. Those types of Hearth Sister, that type of stuff, doesn't draw a card. So it's it's only when he moves um, as his part of his movement phase. So he's pretty mediocre though then you right because he will only draw you one card a turn granted it is poten potentially infinite uh, cards per turn um, and he never impacts the board as far as trading goes unless you walk forward play him and then expect him to just draw one card hit something and be done well his his low HP has sort of diminished the value of that because then you're just playing a lower value blazehound and slower has the potential to be like phoenix fired or removed instantly and the cost of, and the opportunity cost of having him in your deck can be pretty high given that he will not impact the board immediately so you will often replace him if you cannot set him up and uh, be okay the next turn like he doesn't impact the board so if you're surrounded by threats it's pretty useless so you replace him um, he, he's Potential really only shines in the late game, and if you get him set up early and doesn't get answered, right? The mid game, he doesn't trade with the board, he doesn't impact it, so there's a lot of things that go wrong with that. Whereas Blazehound, for example, you play him, you instantly get that card. And it's aggressively statted uh, attack value means that he will trade much better than Mogwai. So that'd be, that'd be the difference when comparing your card draw options right there. So right away you go, well, this common is better than this epic. And you go, yeah, yes it is. So, opportunity cost of Blazehound is about the same at all stages of the game, um, because of the ability to immediately imp draw, impact the board by drawing a card, while also having high value attack. Whereas Mogwai's opportunity cost becomes higher in the mid game, so it'd be like low, high, low. He has like this weird bell curve as far as you know how how useful he is throughout the game. So, it's it's different ways to measure how much impact a card has in your deck. So, then you have Sojourner, who is sort of in a similar position as Mogwe. However, uh, Sojourner is actually much more durable with the five health. A five health is much harder to hit to break than three health. Um, and whenever this minion deals damage, draw a card. It, so it's the same three mana, and it has about, I'd say it has a similar um, opportunity cost as Mogwe because it it's it's really low in the early game and it goes up slightly in the mid game just because it doesn't impact the board immediately sometimes you replace this card when you have four cards in hand just because well with four cards in hand i only need one card play it and then boom boom boom, boom sojourner's gone and then you go oh shoot my hand went back down and now you really want it so like there's this slight bubble of where sojourner is not great to play just because she has that same effect she 
It doesn't impact the Mord immediately. But the potential value behind this card is really high. And if your opponent cannot remove it, you can generate quite a bit of value. Downside is that if you have too much value out of Sojourner, your opponent can eventually mill you cards. So this, this is a really well-balanced card because it has good value for the player. The opponent can abuse it to mill cards out of your deck, which in some cases isn't important, but as the player, you're sort of like, man, I don't, I don't want to mill those cards. That sucks. So there's, there's ups and downs of it, but this is generally one of the best cards for card draw in the game just because of its... Um, opportunity cost being so low relatively and its value being very high so great card all around and I, I recommend most players to craft this card immediately when just coming to do list just because uh, its its uses are very 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 um, varied it, it's applicable in just about every deck uh, as far as beginning decks go now spell jammer this card just recently got changed, um, as recently as November, I believe. It used to be a 3-mana 2-4, now it's a 4-mana 3-5, which I think actually made it stronger um, in a lot of ways. Each player draws an additional card at the end of their turn. <laughs> How good is that? Playing Old Duelist now, you draw two cards. That's great, it means that you play two cards and you draw two cards back, right? So you get a lot of value out of it. And the upside is that people draw cards at the end of their turn, so if you play it and you get the card draw out of it immediately, and your opponent kills it, they didn't get that card draw. So you've got a little bit of a hand advantage trade. The downside is that if the opponent can afford to just ignore the spell jammer and threaten your health quite a bit, you could just be doing them a favor in some ways by drawing them more cards. So it's a give and take, really well designed card. Um, it's also contests the board really well. Uh, probably, I would say, the best neutral legendary in the game. And there are several legendaries in even factions that don't really compare to it, so you know, very important. It's often used in tempo decks, or decks that, I should say, that utilize their cards in, you know, quite fast. Uh, so, like, they play two cards every turn, like aggro decks, etc. So... It can, it can balance out your uh, low, ma low mana curve, meaning you're playing lots of uh, lower mana costed stuff, and you're drawing them back quite efficiently while also having a decent body on the board. So Spelljammer, very good for maintaining hand advantage. Not so great in a, in a high curve deck where like you're running, you know, you get your two drops or whatever, and then, you know, most decks, most decks might have a high two drop thing, and then they... They kind of taper off like this, and they stop at like the four or five stage. Well, some decks will stop at the seven mana, eight mana stage, just because they're running higher costed cards. Like for example, Casaba with Revenants. She wants three Spectral Revenants, runs Obliterates. Then she's also running six drops and five drops. And you're thinking, well, I don't, I don't need Spell Jammer because I'm not going to be playing two six drops in a turn. That's impossible, you know. So there's quite a bit of you know, there's quite a bit of things to think about when you're thinking about card draw and how frequently you will be able to use two cards a turn for a thing like Spelljammer. And you may end up milling yourself, and your opponent even may end up milling you. If they're playing, you know, Magmar and they, they're drawing a lot of cards for you, you, you could end up in sticky situations like that. So always be mindful of what your curve looks like and if you actually anticipate to utilize this effect. Whereas Sojourner has a more steady effect and unless you you know you brick your opponent will have a harder time to mill you cards than other than normal but it will get you steady cards and not you know overflow your hand whereas spell jammer could potentially overflow your hand if your goal is to play one card a turn right so but it's a balancing act now next up we have sworn sister lukeon this card is kind of imbalanced <laughs> as far as uh faction um, equality goes because its opening gambit for four mana is add two random cards from your faction to your action bar now that's two random cards period they're not from your deck they they come out of nowhere like they're just pulled out of you know uh, okay grab them and put them in your deck put them in your hand and that's 
really unfair in some factions because, for example, Vitruvian, they have quite a few uh, dead cards, I want to say. Uh, like Fountain of Youth, and you know, there's there's some cool cards that they can get, but compared to something like Liner, who has very few bad cards, like, I think the worst card you could get is like Orion Nexus, and even then you're giving three health to a minion. So there's, you know, the the power level distribution between the factions, while isn't very fair, it does make it a very powerful card in factions that can utilize the random draw a lot more efficiently. Um, Vanar is a frequent player of this card. I've seen Songhai do okay with it. I, I, I personally don't like it in Songhai, but I've seen Lion Art. It's a staple in basically most Lion Art decks these days, unless you're, you know, this along with side Trinity Oath are both very good options for Lion Art in the late game, even the early game sometimes. Um, I've also seen Abyssian utilize it, but and Magmar, just because they all have strong faction cards for the most part that can be uh, utilized quite efficiently when pulled. They can adapt They can adapt very well to drawing uh, specific cards that, while may not fit their deck, may fit the situations to come. So, you know, be mindful. Um, try to have a good idea of when you want this card and when you don't. Sometimes if you don't see yourself playing two cards for the next two turns in the early game, you may find this card to be a little too clunky, so you replace it. It's more it's more useful as soon as you have the availability to play it and draw both the cards and not mail the card at the end of your turn. So you have to be mindful that it's better as the game goes on, just because even if the cards that you get out of it are completely awful, you can still replace those cards back into your deck. And it sort of saturates your deck a bit to make it less consistent because it puts in two random cards that you didn't want in your deck and you could eventually draw them as well happens quite often to me but that um just that potential card value and hand advantage that you gain from it uh, makes it an excellent option when refilling your, your hand and great for tempo and, and aggro decks again so now i do have a few uh faction specific cards here um to go over. I didn't grab all of them, but I did grab some of the um, more different, I guess, um, options available. Now, Vitruvian has Scion's First Wish, which is a give a friendly minion plus one plus one and draw a card. This is known as a cantrip in card games, where it cycles itself. It has a small ability, <clears throat> it has a bit of an impact, and then it cycles itself. Another card like this would be Inner Oasis, where you give your Three, three mana, give all your minions three health and draw a card. Um, another example of this would be Sphere of Darkness in Abyssian. So cantrips are very powerful. Now, some factions basically live off of cantrips. Like, um, I'd say that Cassava lives off of cantrips right now. Um, so they also have Right of the Undervault, which we'll cover. But this, And Vitruvian lives off of cantrips just because they never really get the time to develop the board minions like we just went over in some cases and can really make use of the um, the cantrip power in their deck to just cycle their deck over and over like um, I have a Vitruvian deck that I'll go over later that really shows this off but uh, the, rather than uh, giving themselves the stability of card draw minions they decide that they want to win the game purely off of hand cycle and just play first wish, play card, then you get more cards that draw more cards. So you basically, you're playing your hand from an ever-shrinking option. However, it just keeps pulling resources into this, you know, this card pulls into this card, which pulls into this card, which pulls in. So sometimes you get that really cool interaction where Vitruvian goes down to three cards, but the three cards in the hand are all cantrips. So it's actually like six cards, you know. You, it's, it's, quite, it's quite cool sometimes. So even though the hand size ends up being smaller, they do tend to get a few more options available to them than other factions do. The downside is that there is a cost of play and it has a sort of a requirement of having minions on board. So it's sort of an underpowered um, archetype in Duelist right now, I would say, just because the amount of cantrips in the game and the, um, the circumstantial requirements of having the minion on the board and other things 
and the situational playability of these types of cards can sometimes just be too poor but it is a very unique style of play and can be really fun when you pull it off so hopefully we get more cantrip support in duelist later but for now it's it's sort of it's it's sort of unique to vitruvian um, as far as that goes um, trinity oath is a uh, new liner card from the new rise of the bloodborne expansion it really <laughs> it really made them strong let's put it that way um, it, it's it was comparable to heaven's eclipse but now it's actually even stronger um, it's actually quite quite strong so i, I won't i won't lie there uh, it's it's a newer spell four card draw it's four mana draw three cards and restore three health to your general <laughs> really strong um it's basically what uh it's basically what Lakeon did for Lionar, just without the minion on the board. Um Lakeon would put something on the board and draw two cards. Now you are healing three for yourself and drawing three cards, which means it replaces itself and then puts two more cards in your hand. Now the advantage here over Lakeon is that these are cards from your deck. Cards you put into your deck to win the game, you know. You wanted these cards, so you get them. But the downside, the trade-off here is that you're not actually putting anything on the board, but your hand, your hand just exploded into tons of options. So this card really, really outclasses what Heaven's Eclipse used to do for Songhai, um, and I hope they I hope they look at that in the future. Just because Songhai used to have some of the best cycle available to them with Mana Vortex, and they nerfed it. Now Heaven's Eclipse is sort of a worse Trinity Oath, even though Heaven's Eclipse used to be a better Rite of the Undervolt, you know? So, there's a lot of, I guess, faction uh, draw disparity between the factions. For example, Vitruvian has no, they have um, that new card, Ooh, I'll think of it, I'll, I'll come back. Um, oh man, it's gonna bug me. <laughs> the, the three mana draw two, I'll, 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 I'll come back. Uh, Heaven's Eclipse, draw three cards from your deck, and, uh, you know, I'm going to look it up right now. I'm going to look it up. Uh, this is going to bug me. I know, we're in a video. Oh, it's going to bug me. Oh, I have a brain fart. Okay, hold on. Hold on. I got it right here. Divine Spark! There we go. Ah, I just don't say that. I just don't say that name enough. Divine Spark, the three mana draw two. Vitruvian... It's it's much less impactful, and while being you know three mana draw two, it's less impactful than Trinity Oath, which is ironic because you would think that from this the the reverse curve of the power level of these cards, Trinity Oath is the strongest, then then Heaven's Eclipse, then Rite of the Undervolt. Even though Rite of the Undervolt draws the most cards, then you have Divine Spark, which it it goes the opposite direction, you know. So Trinity Oath strong, weak, weaker. Then it goes Trinity Oath, weak, weaker, and it's it's kind of strange how that that distribution of of the different curve level of card draw from the different factions sort of went from one end of the spectrum being weak, stronger, stronger, strongest, weak, weaker, weakest kind of thing. So, you know, now I'm not saying that Right of the Undervolt is weak by any means. I'm saying that uh, it, it's Opportunity cost is quite hot, quite high compared to Trinity Oath, because though when you think about it, you're spending six mana, which is your whole turn in most cases, to draw to refill your action bar. Now, you know, on three cards in hand, playing six mana to draw another four cards because it replaces itself. Remember, you're pretty much overpaying for one of these effects. Now, even though you fill your hand. It's basically, it's, it's best case scenario is one, maybe two cards in hand to play this, and then you play a card so you don't mill at the end of your turn, which means you have to have more than six mana to play to make this card work. Or you, you know, you basically give up the, the card that you draw at the end of your turn, which could be very impactful in a Cassava or Abyss, uh, just an Abyssian deck in general, because the card value um, goes way, way up the higher the mana curve goes and milling some of your more important cards can be game game changing 
and I kind of I kind of skipped over Heaven's Eclipse because this is what is known as tutoring in Duelist. There's not a whole lot of tutoring as far as Duelist is concerned right now. There are like I think three effects that tutor off the top of my head. There's um, uh, Artifact Hunter. He's a four mana three three. There's uh, I can actually grab that right now. Just grab him. Doo -doo. All right, we got Artifact Hunter here, and then there's uh, so he he he'd be something known as tutoring, which pulls a very specific type of card from your deck and puts it into your hand. Then there is also oh, I'll I'll come back to it. So we got Artifact Hunter, Heaven's Eclipse pulls three spells from your deck. And I had, I had, oh, Cryogenesis, Cryogenesis, that's what it was. Sorry I'm kind of stumbling around this, this part, but it's a long video. Uh, it's a long video. And I, I sort of just winging the, uh, oh, oh, come on now. Here we go, I got it. Got it for you guys. A cryogenesis. All right, so tutoring is not very prom is not very uh, common in duelists. There are very few effects that actually do it, and over time, all three of the cards that tutor the best have been nerfed. It's kind of a conspiracy. Artifact Hunter used to be a three five. Um, cryogenesis used to be three mana, and Heaven's Eclipse used to be three mana. So, what this means for duelist is that. These cards used to be very powerful because tutoring is an effect that lets you control the outcome of this card draw. So Artifact Hunter, opening gamut, draw a random artifact from your deck. Now, it says random, but if you only put one type of artifact in your deck, you know, <laughs> you know, if I only put Staff of Yakir in my deck and I play Artifact Hunter, I know I'm going to get Staff of Yakir. Cryogenesis. If I put Cryogenesis in my deck, and then I, it says, do, do a four damage to an enemy minion, draw a Vesper minion from your deck. I know that I can put in very specific Vespers or a limited number or only one type of Vesper. Sometimes you used to see people put in, uh, you have three Cryogenesis and then you had one Arctic Displacer back in the day in an old mech deck because you could play Arctic Displacer and Spirit of the Wild for 10 damage, but not anymore. Um, cryogenesis <clears throat> can, can just draw Snow Chaser or just draw... Crystal Cloaker or something like that as well, which means that you can always count on what this card will draw. Heaven's Eclipse, slightly different, um, but you can definitely manipulate, because it draws three cards from your deck, you can you can know, you can um, put in certain spells into your deck and expect to draw those certain spells if you limited, if you leave your options sort of limited. For example, um, inner Focus, Juxtaposition, Mist Dragon Seal. If those are your only spells, you know that you have a good likelihood of drawing a mix of those spells. Now, that, that doesn't mean that you'll draw one of each, but you could draw you know, two Mist Dragon Seals and an Inner Focus, or uh, three Juxtapositions, or a Jux, MDS, Inner Focus. So, you know, it can also draw itself if you have multiple copies of Heaven's Eclipse. But, it's powerful because if you know what's in your deck, you can pretty much give yourself that opportunity to always draw it. So, unfortunately, these cards have been sort of phased out, and we've gotten a little bit of power creep as far as um, one card draw X has gone, but the deck building um, versatility is still there and still available to many different factions that utilize card draw in different ways and more meaningful ways than what you might see on the other end of the spectrum where people are only using neutral uh, minions to um, accommodate their draw. So going over the different levels of card draw is important when considering what options you want to put into your deck in Duelist. And I hope this was meaningful or helpful when deciding what types of card draw is important to what types of decks. And I'll be sort of uh, explaining that when I go over these different archetypes momentarily. So just to recap, um, utilizing different neutral minions to play the board while also play keep your hand high is, is a good strategy, but do not neglect the options of pure card draw from the spell pool 
that is available because it can be a very uh, it can be a very efficient trade off for your deck if you were to um, sort of replace the what the minions would be from the neutral section like instead of three sojourner you can have you know three dioltas or something like that and then you have right at the undervault as your your hand replenish in the late game for your you know your your backup plan contingency plan whatever but so those types of decision making are very important when uh, considering what type of card draw to go into your deck so next up we have defining archetypes in duelist and the first you'll notice that I chose aggro tempo mid-range control combo now that's that's very basic these types of uh, names exist in other card games like uh, Hearthstone, uh, Eternal, uh, all those, you know, Magic. This type of naming is completely... Uh, I just wanted to have the... Uh, I just wanted to have very um, well-known concepts to explain rather than uh, choose some random ones that don't don't exist in other card games from that only exist in Duelist. So I'm not covering all the different archetypes in Duelist. I'm just going to be explaining some of the more popular ones and the ones that are relatable from other card games. So first up, we have aggro. Now I have two lists here. Um, one is it's similar to Cranky Panda's uh, aggro fay, but this is my own aggro fay actually very similar deck builds um, and aggro vath this is something I threw together just for the video now, these are in no way meant to be definitive um, they're not meant to say that this is the best or anything but they are here as examples and uh, first I'm gonna cover the aggro fey <clears throat> and I'm gonna go over some of the deck building concepts now you'll notice right away well, this deck is almost primarily three ofs there are only you know three different instances of two ofs in the deck there are no one ofs so that means right away you know that the deck is going to be more consistent based on the cards that the amount of different unique cards that are in the deck so three blood tears three, you know a, a certain number of two drops and then you have three drops four drops and the curve stops at four so this is very typical of aggro decks where you'll see you know, maybe a few ones, but mostly it's the power level spikes on the two. You have so many twos, you have a few threes, a few fours, and then it cuts off. That's very typical in aggro decks. And you'll see it similar effect in Vath. Um, the power, like I said, the power spikes on two, a little bit more on the three and four for this deck. And you'll see that there are uh, McCanters over here on the six slot. And that is uh, very standard Magmar stuff because McCanter is just so powerful in what it does. And they even have the ability to cheat it out in this deck with Flash Reincarnation. So it's, it's, kind, of an, an, it's kind of an illusion as far as to this being the curve. Since these are very similar curves and um, their whole goal is to go face, pretty much. Uh, they do very limited trading and the trading that they do do, they want to be very efficient. For example, in Faye, um, if she's going to have to remove something, she wants it to be very, very, very efficient. And Enfeeble does just that. This card right there. Um, Enfeeble turns all the minions into 1-1s one that are on the board. So they can, uh, if they absolutely have to answer the board, it becomes very easy to. You just switch, you know, quick Enfeeble, then you could even combo with Blood Tear or Scorn and remove the whole board. So... Quick and, quick and um, easy, deal with their board, and can still go face. Um, you'll notice that there are a lot of options for doing damage out of hand, which is like these Cryptographers, these Flame Blood Warlocks. Um, they let you make good usage of your burn that is uh, basically uninteractive <laughs> in some ways, um, while also having something like Alsu and Loremaster to help cycle things like Concealing Shroud, chromatic cold so this is this is a very um, high level aggro deck where they're not solely reliant on things like saber spine tiger plus plus buff card go face it's more about making your damage unavoidable 
and making sure that all the damage you put out sort of um, has very uh, it's it's very it, like I said it's unavoidable and it's very um, efficient so while it may look like a bunch of little chip damage adding up it actually adds up quite fast and one turn of concealing shroud plus white asp or something like that or you flame blood warlock and concealing shroud the health dis differential is staggering I mean you get to bypass your opponent's things with hearth sister or you play something a little out of reach and the hearth sister it in there's a lot of options there and this is very um, typical in aggro thinking you can see similar effects in VAP where um, I don't want to tra interact with your board so much as I want to ignore it and you'll find cards like repulsor beast are very popular in these types of decks um, as well if the provoke meta comes back you'll see repulsor beast come in and uh, hollow grovekeeper I've even seen in aggro decks just because uh, provoke stops rush and you have the ability to bypass the rush so or, or just ephemeral shroud to dispel the provoke and then go face so while not going face every single turn that's definitely the hope and the dream and that is what keeps these types of decks alive most of the decks are aimed, most of the cards are aimed primarily at doing damage and dealing with threats very efficiently again you'll see similar themes in this vath deck um i put in <coughs> healing mystic rather than something like flame blood because vath's primary goal is to utilize his bloodborne spell to push damage alongside his threats and so it sort of helps mitigate some of that early damage that you'll be taking no matter what with your face while also being a two drop that can carry buff spells like greater fortitude and stuff so Vath is slightly different than Faye because he has to interact more with the board and that is because he has rush minions that carry buffs now the difference between these two is that Vath's minions carry much more efficient buffs like thumping wave and greater fortitude they're very efficient compared to something like um, wailing overdrive that could that Faye could have been running for theater swing tiger it's really hard to argue that six mana saber swing tiger plus thumping wave for eight damage is bad you know <laughs> the thumping wave also doubles as threat removal so no longer are they, do they really need to have egg morph in the deck they can just thumping wave something if they absolutely have to while also running um you'll notice that for card draw up here he only had spell jammer and then he had a cantrip um in frigid corona and sort of pseudo card retention from also lore master to pull back cards into your hand but not a ton of different options as far as card cards go whereas vath he's running no minions that draw cards for him but rather has cantrip in um entropic gaze which is two two mana four damage to the opponent draws both player cards so it cycles itself very efficient damage probably the most <laughs> damage efficient card in the game right now and then you have tectonic spikes which is very powerful in a deck designed to dump its hand very early meaning you turn one <clears throat> going second you could play double two drop and then turn two you play another two drop and then tectonic spike and refill your hand no mill that's very very powerful for magmar because it pushes damage to the opponent puts threats on the board and punishes someone who may just be playing a normal curve deck where they play two drop and then they play a four drop from the mana tile or a two drop and then you know double two drop or two drop and three drop so their their hand is staying relatively full because they don't want to overcommit to the board yet and you just drew them three cards that they can't even play and that's a threat that uh, magmar has right now is that they continuously uh, pressure the opponent into playing multiple cards each turn and because of their efficient damage outputs they can outpace the opponent at different stages of the game and if you're running something like plasma storm and they you force them to overcommit to the board because they're scared of milling then you can easily um, take advantage of their weakened board state so there are a lot of ways to exploit the opponents um, inefficient deck building I guess compared to yours but it's also a sort of double-edged sword because you uh, end up taking quite a bit of damage and don't have ways to mitigate it so 
especially if you play th multiple elucidators or you hit things that are too big for you. So limited removal options available, but high damage output is tr sort of the set the trademark of Agrovath, and uh, so efficient damage, efficient threat removal with more chip based damage is the sort of the trademark of Agro Fey. So two different aggro styles, but their goal is very similar, and you, even with that, you'll find that the curve stays similar. And this is true for other aggro decks like Aggro Lionar, you'll see, Aggro Songhai. Uh, I didn't want to cover Aggro Songhai here because they're very different than most aggro decks, and that is something I'll, I'll probably expand on in a different video. But this is more or less stylistic choices that you will see very frequently in deck building for Duelist. Uh, even in two different factions that you can sort of take into your own consideration. So, next up, we have Tempo. Now, I chose two Tempo decks for this, <clears throat> and the first one is very, you know, very recognizable. This is very common in the latter. This is my personal Tempo deck um, from recent days uh, for Lionar where the whole point of the deck is to cheat out big threats and uh, or I'm sorry cheat cheat out a very strong board while also removing the opponent's board very efficiently and having uh, like over they, they just have very overstated minions so the whole point of this deck is to turn one two drop uh, if you're going first or turn one three drop if you slow slow on the mana tile and uh, silver guard knight or it's crazy what you can do but and then use your efficient removal in the deck via uh, arc light sentinel and blood tier to sort of put threats on the board and remove the opponent's threats while also capitalizing on arc light regalia to push face damage and remove threats early game and you can overwhelm your opponent very quickly with the bloodborne spell and, your, and with your your overstatted minions like Windblade Adept and Silverguard Knight, and just sort of surround them right away, put the pressure on from turn one to the end of the game, you are always keep applying pressure. And that is very, very, very strong these days when decks are designed to more or less uh, curve out and not have so much um, hand emptying. And with the addition of Trinity Oath, it has made this type of deck much stronger in a sense, because if they puke their whole hand onto the board early on, which is very free, very common for um, Tempo Argeon, they can just play one card and now replenish the whole hand and even mitigate some of the damage that they may have taken early on, or use Lakeon. And you'll see some people run three Lakeons, two Trinity Oaths, or not even run Trinity Some people don't even run Trinity Oath, and I think, I think that's wrong. But I think it's a good mix of these two. And you'll find yourself... Uh, pretty much always having high card advantage high have having a high card count with high options available to uh, keep the pressure up um, so this is this is probably the staple tempo deck of duelist here's one that's not so a lot of people don't really realize that this is more of a tempo deck than it is um, a value deck this is uh, my <laughs> stone to spears uh, SimCity Xerix. Now, is this list optimal? No, but it it it, 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 it it's definitely fun, and it was uh, it one I wanted to show off some of the card draw that uh, I was talking about as far as the faction identity goes, the cantrip based card draw and playstyle. You notice that there aren't any of the regular card draw options available in the minion pool, but we do have three different cantrips available. We have First Wish. Um, Whisper of the Sands and Inner Oasis. <coughs> Excuse me. And these cards perform deck thinning, meaning that if I play this card, I'm drawing a different card. You know, so it's it's you can sort of count like First Wish is a very good deck thinner. puts one one on a stat on a creature while also drawing a card. So I actually have more more ways to cycle into my powerful damage output cards, and you know less. But I also have. Um, more contingencies to rely upon, like having a minion on the board in order to interact with Inner Oasis and First Wish. Uh, Whisper of the Sands can only really get any value out of it if you have the uh, Obelisks on the board. So that's sort of the minion-related dependencies for cantripping that I was talking about. That makes it 
uh, not as powerful of an archetype in some ways, but it can still be a very powerful one, um, nonetheless. So the way the reason the reasoning behind the tempo is that this deck will always try to two for one the board, and uh, if you, for example, if I play an obelisk and my opponent doesn't answer it right away, I can immediately seize the board in a lot of ways. Like I can use Dunecaster and Primus Fist or other things like um, Whisper of the Sands to generate more value out of the board and put more threats on the board than the opponent can deal with right away. And that is, so it's like, it's, it's like a sleeper tempo deck because they capitalize very quickly on having a board state much better than a lot of other decks do and they can they can snowball out of control very very quickly which is what i which is what i would consider a trademark of tempo decks is the ability to snowball argion for example he will snowball quite you know aggressively if you can't answer the first couple of things that are on that board then they snowball out of control and you you're pretty much losing the game from turn three onwards right same goes for uh, Xerix. They snowball quickly out of control with just a couple of obelisks or just a couple of minions on the board with um, Inner Oasis on them. So there's a lot of power behind these decks, but they can run out of steam very quickly if they brick their their you know their hand cycle options. Like Vitruvian, or Argeon never draws his card draw, and you remove his threats, and Xerix gets all his stuff dispelled and doesn't have the ability to replenish the board state. So there's a lot of risk, but there's a lot of reward for these types of decks. And in Duelist, some other similar tempo decks might be, um, I would consider Swarm Abyssian, just pure Swarm, no Variax. Abyssian to be a, sort of a tempo deck because they snowball very quickly with Deathfire Crescendo, Solgrimmar, that type of stuff. Um, you'll also find like Zukara, where she's playing like Lady Locke or Mirkblood Devourer plus one drops like Zix, etc. <clears throat> that can be high tempo. And she snowballs out of control, but the ability to be answered um, by heavy AoE sort of inhibits these decks from being too good. For example, Plasma Storm. Um, so there are, you know, fail safes in and, and also in Feeble from Thanner. These these types of decks can be limited by what is by what the meta is available or what the meta is like, and that can be detrimental to their you know, their play styles, but that snowball potential is always there, regardless of what opponent you're playing against. So, sort of a trademark of tempo decks. And like I, like I said, they often will trade card advantage just to secure the board state and win off of that early tempo. So, next up, mid-range, I have, uh, this is Cranky Panda's Fey, who... This is an, a little bit of an older deck, but I thought it was a perfect example of a, of a strong mid-range deck, and I grabbed my own um, mid-range Saj from a month ago or so, where mid-range was once a very popular archetype in Duelist across like all the factions. Basically, everyone would play Dancing Blades, everyone would play Diotas, everyone would play the same, you know, the same neutral mirepoix of minions to contest the board against each other because if I have my Deoltis and you have your Deoltis, then they cancel each other out, right? Same with Dancing Blades, etc. So it's sort of faded out as we've gone through a couple expansions now, but trademarks of a mid-range deck are that the win condition is more or less securing the board and capitalizing on having a strong mid-game. Meaning they play two drops, then they want to curve into four drops, and then they play more four drops and more four drops to sort of take advantage of the the, uh, the board state early on, and then they want to win with those same minions <clears throat> by just continuously applying the same pressure. And that sounds similar to tempo, however, the minions are more value-oriented, or the, uh, the removal is more cost-efficient in some ways. So you'll find mid-range decks tend to be less snowball-y than tempo because with, uh, like, a, not, not counting Razorback, for example, if I have 
um, just a few minions on the board. I'm not going to be applying enough pressure to win the game in the next turn. Um, I'm going to be continuously trying to keep the minion advantage on the board and sort of milk those resources in order to keep my opponent at a disadvantage. So you'll see things like <clears throat> Sojourners are quite frequent in these types of decks. Um, having a, a few, you know, deal with the Sojourners, Dancing Blades are quite frequent because they're very good transition cards into what your uh, ultimate um, pressure card is. For Vitruvian, that would be Amara Healer. That's a 6 mana 5-5. Five, five. Provoke, and it has a 10 health swing on its Dying Wish. And for this deck, you see that Jack's True Sight also ha is the 6 mana power card. Now, does that mean that they, they look to win off of playing these cards, sort of, and keeping a strong board in the in the upcoming turns to that saj um, also has autark's gift for a little extra damage stars fury and you'll see that cranky has a lot of um removal uh, aoe with enfeeble and and uh frostburn while also having a snowball card like razorback if he happens to just have a bunch of minions on the board and you know so they're they're sort of pull, pull a little bit of an opposite for mid-range, but if you look at the curves, very similar. You know, six one drops, um, slightly higher two drop count for uh, Cranky, but they're running actually the same number of two drop minions. The difference is that this two drop is sort of inflated by Chromatic Cold, whereas Vitruvian doesn't have a two mana spell. Um, six, 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 three, and you have, you know, nine, five, five, five. So it's very similar curve where they go up, they go up, or this way, up, or up, down, and then plateau. That would be more of a mid-range style curve, where you're just constantly wanting to play those mid-range threats and win off of that. So, uh, you, another another mid-range type of deck could be... Um, <clears throat> I've seen Vaths do it, or Starhorns, where they'll play a bunch of one-drops and look to you know play Mandrake early, and I, I would call that mid-range, because the threats aren't actually superimposing, but they end up snowballing into a lead. Another mid-range deck might be uh, that Van Arcara one that we talked about, where they play a lot of value-oriented minions in the mid-game. And uh, some sort of... Some, some liner decks, like uh, Ziran, tends to be a little bit more mid-range. However, they're, they're kind of weird because she doesn't really use her minions to fight a whole lot. While um, <clears throat> you'll also see Argeon with Iron Cliffs and stuff like that tend to be mid-range. Um, mid-range is also sort of faded out due to the rise of single target removal being much stronger and Enfeeble being so oppressive against these types of decks where you, you'll play Dealthus and then you'll play Dancing Blades and, and Sojourner and Enfeeble turns them all into 1-1s one -ones for 3 mana and you're just like, boom, dang darn. Punish is another great card for answering these types of decks. So... This sort of this archetype is sort of fallen out, but it is one that is highly supportive or of budgets because a lot of the cards in mid range decks tend to be more affordable and are typically what you would expect a great gauntlet deck to be as well. So there's a, there's a bit of a mix and match of the love for mid range, but it is an archetype nonetheless that Duelist supports very well. Now, for control decks, I have three different decks. Um, the first one, this is probably the uh, oops, wrong one. Probably the only the only Songhai deck. Oh no, I have two. I have another Songhai deck. Never mind. Never mind. This is uh, I tried to replicate Dregal's control Reva the, um, with with this list. I think he runs very similar. I, I'm not sure if his newest iteration runs Zendo. I know he has run it in the past. I've seen him run. Um, these uh, Night Watchers, I've seen him run Hollow Grove Keepers, but this is more, I wanted to get put Zendo in here just more of as, as a, a show, but this would definitely be an example of a control Songhai deck. You'll notice that uh, what makes this different from most Rivas is that there's no inner focus, and there's no killing edge. So the deck doesn't, the deck isn't abusing things like Heartseeker Killing Edge, it's more or less trying to uh, establish a, a 
insurmountable board state and deal with the opponent's board very efficiently. Uh, so you'll have... It actually runs Dispel as well, which is different. And you'll see that the win condition is pretty well defined with Double Spiral Technique or Zendo. So playing strong early game um, momentum based minions, Shiro makes uh, just the, even the slightest board state much more powerful because it can buff Heart Seekers, it can buff Lantern Five, buffing all these cards. And um, <clears throat> that can be very empowering for a Songhai deck because it lets them get more value out of their already fragile minion states that they tend to have. You'll notice that a lot of Songhai decks tend to run weaker minions as far as just stat lines go, but with the added effect of a Shiro, you can get a lot of value out of them quite quickly. So uh, value generators like Lantern Fox and Sojourner are noticeable for uh, Songhai lately. Uh, with the loss of va uh, Mana Vortex, Sojourner has really risen in um, popularity as another card draw mechanic because these two, Lantern Fox isn't often seen as it, but it is actually a uh, pseudo draw. It puts Phoenix Fires into your hand that can be replaced, and that's great because keeping your card advantage up as Songhai is something that's sort of difficult to do since they often want to play multiple cards each turn. Their curves are very low. So the more cards you can replenish into your hand, the better off you will be. And Dioltas as well as Bone Reaper are signature control cards just because they have they make the board um, very tough to bypass. The opponent has to have answers to these cards or else they will just never be able to pressure and answer threats, backline threats, that, a bit, that Songhai often put out. And if the opponent is spending all their time fighting these Provoke minions, it makes setting up for Spiral Technique much easier because this is a controllable 8 damage burst that suddenly comes, you know, your opponent's like, well, they only have Bone Reaper and their General on the board, and I'm at 12 health, so I'll play this minion. And well, suddenly Spiral Technique, 8 mana, 8 damage, out of nowhere. So the win condition is fairly streamlined, and the, the deck looks to control the board at most stages in the game while also inhibiting your opponent from being too aggressive. Sometimes you'll see more um, Night Watchers, but Night Watcher is a signature control card. Um, and this is just a good example of how you can repurpose a faction's aggressive cards into control cards by using cards like Phoenix Fire to control the board and transition that lead into uh, just, just a setting up for a one to two turn kill. So excellent uh, deck decision making by Drago, and I, I really enjoy a lot of the themes that go along with the deck like this. Cassava is probably the, uh, I guess, you know, premier control deck of Duelist as far as when, when people think of, you know, control decks in Duelist, this is one that would come to the mind the most. Now this isn't, you know, this isn't an op a fully perfect optimized list, but this is one that I've, that I've used quite a bit and uh, I hope just sort of sheds light on all the different potential that can be found in the cast of a control list. The deck runs 15 two drops. Well, three of them are dispels. is still available if you need it. <clears throat> uh, it also utilizes the draw mechanic that we talked about with Right of the Undervault rather than running minions to keep the hand, held, the hand count high because it wants to really make sure that it never falls behind in the early game. Utilizing Kalino to heal off of... Um, the whole point of the deck is just continuous removal of the opponent's board so I can get to the late game while also establishing creep dominance and uh, just play threat after threat after threat into victory. Meaning revenant, 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 obliterate kind of thing. So it wants to go late game, it wants to go late mana, it doesn't wanna it doesn't wanna fight in the early game too much. The general spends quite a bit of time running away to avoid aggro damage and has a lot of tools at its disposal to remove threats as well as replenish the life total. Uh, Nether Summoning is an interesting tech that has sort of shown up lately as far as the ladder goes. Um, you'll see it quite frequently with Kalino and Revenant because if your opponent kills a Kalino, for example, if a Truvian opponent kills a Kalino, they had to expend a lot of resources to do that. If you just pull it right back, <laughs> it makes it very difficult for the opponent to deal with it. 
also revenant when people kill revenants and you just pull it back for five mana and get another one it's really really hard <laughs> also juggernaut these are just, they're just great cards um a lot of the, three punish two demonic lures those cards um make single target removal trivial and uh also net you a lot of tempo since they are so low cost so a control deck that focuses more on the late game and just continuously outmaneuvering the opponent and uh really there's there's some other cards that go into a deck like this that um some people choose like reaper the nine moons and stuff like that but as far as control is concerned this is one of the premier control decks as they always have they're always trying to answer the board and keep their life total up so that they can play their threats late game so and the last control deck I have is my personal uh, Lilith deck. This is one that I've actually had a lot of success with this deck, so I figured why not just throw it up here. This is a Lilith Variax deck with one of crossbones. Um, I think this deck is like 19 and 1 for me on the ladder right now, which is great. It's like top 5 S rank, or it was yesterday, whatever it is now. Who knows? Uh, <clears throat> Now it's uh, the whole. What I what makes this deck a control deck is not only does it have, you know, certain removal options. It, but as soon as you get that variax out and you start pumping out two five fives or more each turn, nobody can nobody can go toe to toe trading anymore. They have to kill you. They can't outvalue you on the board. It's the premier value deck because as soon as all of these threats start coming out every turn with the bloodborne spell change from from variax you just you your opponent is on a clock no matter what whether that's a 10 turn clock to a 15 turn clock to a three turn clock it's kind of up to how you draw but you will you will win if they do not find a way to bypass the minions and do damage to you across the board it's also really good at hiding behind its own minions so they're forced to do out of hand damage or range threats and with the heal effects of Kalino uh, being so strong in a deck like this because you always have minions to trade and sort of cheat life back uh, it's just it becomes really oppressive for the opponent to try and respond so I would say that this is one of the ultimate control decks just because the the um, the, definitive, the definitiveness of the win condition is so pure and so hard to surmount as an opponent that uh, you you have quite a few advantages in that. So high aggro deck, high ag highly aggressive decks um, do a little better against this type of deck. But if they get the if they get that early game draw where they you know they play a turn two, turn three variax. You know you're gonna be in trouble as an aggro player because they have they're pumping up five fives, so there's quite a few ways that this deck outvalues even aggro decks. So, um, just another example of a different form of control that's available in Duelist due to the board state, rather than um, just due to provokes or massive amounts of removal. So, and the last archetype I want to go over is the combo archetype. This this has sort of um, evolved in Duelist. There used to be one-turn kill decks, like Vitruvian one-turn kill, where they play artifacts and Aurora's Tears to kill the opponent. Then you had, you know, Lantern Fox one-turn kill in Songhai, and um, Trilucidator one-turn kill from Magmar. Well, those decks have all sort of fallen out. I think Artifact Vitruvian can still do fairly okay, but it's not so common anymore. So I wanted to hit some of the more common... Um, combo decks that have sort of ar arisen in the past few months and the first one will be uh this is just my personal um starhorn burn deck now the reason i call this a combo deck is it is sort of it's aggro oriented but the idea behind the deck is to apply early pressure and then finish the opponent off by five by s between five to seven mana this is the goal every game to win by five to seven mana it it's not necessarily to win by turn four mana it's or you know but it is the whole goal of the deck is combo oriented to find certain combo pieces uh in my hand by five to seven mana like decimus plus tectonic spikes 
being 9 damage. With Bloodborne Spell, that's 11 damage, out of hand completely. So that's quite a bit of burst with just two combo cards. You can also find Elucidator Thumping Wave for 10 damage. Or if you have, you know, if you're playing Decimus plus Tectonic Spikes and then you find something like Flash Reincarnate and um, Flame Blood, it's an extra 3 damage. Entropic Gaze. So it's it has quite a bit of control options as well. I, I have I like Scorn because it keeps down things like Lilith or Jack's True Sight or Gravity Wells. I have Plasma Storm to help with that as well. Um, and then Macanter, of course, with Flash to really snowball that damage or to do to that dual purpose damage and removal. <clears throat> but it doesn't play so aggressively that Starhorn himself tries to get too low. I used to have um what you call it? Rancor in here. But I decided that Rancor just didn't have good enough synergy with Natural Selection, and I opted for Grow instead because it is a threat that your opponent sort of needs to answer, or else it'll just get too much value very quickly. So combo-oriented because of its um, need to find the cards to line up, like Decimus, and it sort of wins off of those across the board rather than uh, just keeping constant pressure as opposed to like Agrovath or something like that. So a little bit different than an, than your typical aggro deck, even though it still has those same tools to output the same sort of damage. The win condition is not defined by how much pressure you put on the opponent right away. It's just more uninteractive late game. Then you have... <clears throat> this is this is sort of an, uh, a deck that has fallen... It was really popular when, it, when the concept first came out, but it's sort of fallen out of favor just because of the inconsistencies of made unavailable to it. <coughs> Excuse me. This would be the Baconator Reva deck. I just I've sort of thrown together one that um, might be more relevant with the Rise of the Bloodborne, utilizing Ethereal Blades and such. Um, basically, the whole concept of the deck is to play Tusk Boar with a buff spell and Mirror Meld for a lots of burst damage, and the opponent, uh, unless they're running good provokes or were on a on a unable to take or, or avoided taking damage from your other threats early on uh, it's sort of it's hard to stop this sort of uh, damage potential because of cards like juxtaposition as well as phoenix fire and then you even have some late game tools like zendo to re-pull the opponent back into position so you'll notice that this deck utilizes the spelljammer draw and heaven's eclipse Heaven's Eclipse um, is there more or less to try and find mirror melds and buff cards or situational cards, but this is an instance of what I was talking about where sometimes Heaven's Eclipse can be too oversaturated. Like, there is just too many spells here for me to reliably pull any one of them with Heaven's Eclipse. However, because of the given the nature of the deck being so combo-oriented, if I play a combo of cards, like I, I suddenly slam out, you know, Katara, Inner Focus... Juxtaposition, Killing Edge, boom, four cards down. I draw one back with the Killing Edge on Katara, but hand advantage goes into the gutter. And Spelljammer doesn't impact that immediately. So sometimes you'll see one to two Heaven's Eclipse in a deck like this to replenish the hand and give yourself more options while also giving you cards to replace away if you need to. Which is pretty good. Um, you have Adjudicator to hit the combo pieces so you can play more of them in one turn. Um, and... Like I said, Zendo to kind of help you um, close out games that just went the distance and take away some of that pressure the opponent might or may, may or may not have. So just another good example of a combo deck that it tries to align certain cards in the hand to output damage rather than just consistently always putting damage out. It, it may hold off on doing things so that it may do th bigger things later. And that's sort of the premise of a combo in Duelist. Now, um, but yeah, that, those are just some of the basic archetypes that I wanted to cover in this video to sort of give you an example of what what sort of makes people make the decisions they do when deck building, um, as far as Duelist goes. Uh, the next video will have more deck types to look at. Um, I look look to cover more generals that may be underrepresented as well as um, a couple of key tactic considerations to consider, like when to tech certain cards in your deck for the meta, when to um, 
you know, what, what sort of positional based cards should you be thinking about when you want, when you're wanting to mind game your opponent. So well, I have a lot of good ideas for the next video and I hope you guys find this useful and uh, I hope it wasn't too scatterbrained as far as uh, going over some of the concepts, but yeah, hopefully to see you guys again very soon for another one of these and until then keep it classy. Take care guys.